Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is our week three meeting. As you know, the guest speaker today is Mickey Morandini. Thank you for being here, Mr. Morandini. Yeah. I'm really happy to get to hear from him. Uh, we'll go over the schedule real quick. Oops. Um, so first thing first, I'm going to give a quick introduction of him, and then I'm going to let him do most of the talking. Uh, he's going to give his background, his experience, and I'm going to lead a very quick discussion, ask some questions. Um, our e going to ask some questions, and after about 15 minutes, we're going to go ahead and open it up to the audience. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask away. Um, I would love to have people asking, uh, raising your hand, I'll call on you and you can ask him personally. And if you don't want to say anything, if you want to keep keep your camera off, that's fine. Uh, you can just go ahead and type it in the chat and I can go ahead and read it for you. And then at the very end, if you guys could stick around just for a little bit, we'll have a schedule of what we're going to be doing for the next couple of weeks. So without further ado, who is Mickey Morandini? Currently, he's an ambassador for the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, as far as education, he played at the University of Indiana from 85 to 88. He is currently working with the Phillies as an ambassador since 2017 is when he started. Um, his career was as a professional baseball player, as we know. He was a 1988 Olympic gold medalist, which is pretty sweet. He played for the Phillies from 90 to 97 and then again in 2000. And in that period, he was an all-star in 95. Uh, he played for the Cubs in between 97 and 2000. And then again with the Blue Jays at the very end. Uh, as far as coaching experience goes, he started coaching high school in 2007 with Valparaiso High School until 2010, um, and then eventually worked his way up to the Philadelphia Phillies in 2015, where he was a first base coach until he became an ambassador. Um, and as far as team management goes, he worked with the Williamsport Crosscutters, which I'm, if I'm not mistaken, is a summer league. Is that correct? No, it's a rookie ball league, which actually um, last year Major League Baseball wiped out 40 minor league team, minor league teams, and unfortunately Williamsport was one of them. But that's our rookie, that was our rookie league team. Oh wow! And then the dang, that's crazy. And the Lakewood Blue Claws is also a minor league team. Yes, as well. Okay, awesome. So we had some minor league experience, some major league experience, and now obviously works for the Phillies. Um, so that's all that I have. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the screen. And Mickey, if you want to just go through your, your experience up into the big leagues, what you've seen since you've been there and since you've become a coach and ambassador. Yeah, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go about halfway with my experiences. Um, you know, a lot of fans don't know the path that players take to get to the big leagues. They see all these great players, but they really don't know what they did to get there. So I'm just kind of going to give you my path to the big leagues from when I was little. I'll kind of go halfway, maybe up through my college years, and I'll, I'll, we can open it up to some questions. And then uh, after the questions, I'll kind of go on uh, with the big league uh, stuff after that, if that's okay. Um, you're going to find that I can talk baseball for hours and hours and hours. So if I start rambling and get too long, just tell me to shut up and I'll shut up and we can go to questions. But uh, so, you know, I grew up in a really small town just north of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, my graduating class was 98 students, so it was really small. Uh, our class levels here in Pennsylvania are A, AA, AAA, uh, 4A, and 5A. Um, we were in A school, so we were with the smallest level of uh, school that there was out there. Um, my father passed away when I was four. Never really knew him or have memories of him, to be honest with you. Um, so I grew up with my mom, my older brother, who was seven years older than me, and some great grandparents. And um, what got me into the sports thing was my grandparents were always listening to the Pittsburgh Pirates on the radio. Uh, my brother was into sports. I, he actually ended up becoming the sports editor of a paper in the Pittsburgh area for 30 years. Um, so that kind of got me interested in sports. My main two sports as a young kid was basketball and baseball. And to be honest with you, my first love was basketball. I just loved playing the sport. I loved the speed of the game, the competition of basketball. So to be honest, when I was young, basketball for me was number one. Baseball was number two. And I did all the things every uh, young kid does. I played in Little League. Um, and oddly enough, I played for the Phillies in Little League. Uh, little did I know that that would come back uh, uh, later on. Um, so I did the little league thing. I did the Legion ball thing was what we had back in the day. I don't know what they call it now, Babe Ruth or some other things. Um, that was as a, like a 13 or 14 year old. Uh, we did not have middle school baseball, uh, where I grew up. Um, I played CYO basketball, Catholic youth, youth organization basketball when I was young. Um, and then I got to high school, I got to ninth grade and I was fortunate enough to, 
uh, be athletic enough to make the high school team in both basketball and baseball. Um, and um, just had a really good high school career. I was one of the best athletes in our high school. I was to be honest with you. I was one of the best athletes in the area. Um, I led our high school in career points. Uh, when I graduated as a senior, that's a record that I think still stands. Um, and, you know, like I said, I had a love for basketball. I just love the speed of the game. And, but what I did when I was little, um, and it's a little different now for kids because you have the computers, you have the video games, uh, you have the phones and all this technology that's out there. None of that was out there when I was young. So when I came home from school, um, I was fortunate enough to live next to the elementary school that I used to go to. So I would come home from school and I would just do my homework and I'd go outside and play. I'd have a ball in my hand every day. If I didn't have someone to play with, I would go down to the school and I'd throw a ball against the wall and field it. And uh, we had a basketball hoop down there. I'd go down there and shoot hoops every day. I'd shoot, you know, hundred shots a day, whatever. And I uh, played an enormous amount of wiffle ball. Wiffle ball was the thing back in the day. I played an enormous amount of wiffle ball with my friends, my older brother. But the one thing I did do when I was young is I played more with my older brother's friends than I really did my friends. So I kind of played, you know, against kids that were a lot older than me. And what I found was I was kind of holding my own um, playing against the, the, the older kids. And obviously, as a young kid, you gain confidence doing that. So um, that's why I think I became I was a really good uh, defensive player my entire career. And I think part of the reason I was, was because of all these different things I did when I was young, throwing the ball against the wall. Um, we actually had in my house, we had a one unattached uh, car garage and we had a stone driveway. And I used to go outside and, and on the one side of the, the garage door is a concrete wall that goes up and it was probably 18 inches wide. And I used to get about 40, 50 feet from that concrete, concrete wall I'd get a tennis ball and I'd throw it against the wall and I'd have that ball come back to me. But on the stone driveway, it would do some funky things. So I would have to really concentrate and try and catch it. And I would make a game out of it. And I did that every day. And, and the best part about it was if I missed that concrete wall to the right, the ball would go down a huge hill and I would have to go chase it and run down this hill. And that's something obviously I didn't want to do. So I really concentrated on on throwing mechanics and being accurate. So the two things I did the best in the big leagues was I caught the baseball and I was able to be accurate in my throws. And I really think just from throwing as a young kid against that garage really had an impact on my career. So, you know, like I said, I, I go to high school and, and have great college, uh, high school basketball career. I had a great um, high school baseball career. Now, back then you could get drafted out of high school and you still can as a senior. Um, so I went to a couple of tryouts, um, pirates had a tryout, the, the Cincinnati Reds had a tryout at old riverfront stadium. So I, I went to those two tryouts. I did well, but I'm going to be honest with you. When I was young, I was 5'10 and I was about 145 pounds. I mean, I was frail. I was skinny, never lifted a weight in my life. Um, never did any of that weightlifting back then. For baseball players, it really was non-existent, to be honest with you. Really, only football players lifted weights. So I was this really, you know, young kid that wasn't very strong but was fast. That was my thing back in the day. I could put the ball in play. I had some pop, even though I was skinny, but I was fast. I could run. And uh, so when I went to these tryout camps, I really impressed them with my speed. But I still had a lot of growing to do body-wise where, you know, some more arm strength, uh, some more pop off the bat, things like that. So I did not get drafted out of high school. Um, and the good thing was that I had some major colleges interested in me for baseball. And I had some uh, division two type schools interested in me for basketball. So I guess my first big choice was um, as an athlete was what school was I going to go to? And what sport was I going to play? Now, the, the, the smaller schools said you can play both basketball and baseball, which really was intriguing to me. I really didn't want to have to give up basketball. But in the final say, I knew I had no future in basketball. I mean, I was 5'10". I could shoot. Um, 
But, uh, you know, there was no way I was playing in the NBA. Let's put it that way. So I knew if there was a future in sports, it was going to be baseball. Um, so I committed. I had three really major schools come after me. Indiana University from the Big Ten, Iowa from the Big Ten, and a couple of bigger schools in Pennsylvania like Pitt and Penn State, those types of schools. So I ended up going to Indiana University uh, in the Big Ten and starting my college career there. Now, the shortstop, I played shortstop. I was a shortstop and a pitcher. Uh, but by the time I was a high school senior, uh, I didn't throw very hard. Um, I had to trick people to get people out. So I was a, mainly a shortstop. Um, so I went to Indiana University. Um, they had an All-American shortstop that was going to be a senior. So I couldn't play short that year. So they moved me to third base. And I actually started as a freshman, as the third baseman there. Um, so... Um, had a great freshman year, uh, hit over 400 at Indiana University, played good defense at third base. Um, following year, sophomore year, the uh, All-American was gone. I got to go back to play shortstop and had another, I had my best year in college, hit over 430 with some homers and a bunch of doubles. Um, I still hold, I think, four records at the university for doubles, runs scored, stolen bases and triples, I believe. Um, so that's pretty awesome that, the the thing back when I played college is there was no game limit. We could play as many games as we wanted. So we normally played almost 90 games in college. I believe nowadays college baseball, you're only allowed, I believe in the fifties, 56, 58 games, something like that. Um, so I did have an advantage that I was able to play probably a lot more games than a lot of these, uh, college players play today, but. Uh, after my sophomore year, came back in for my junior year. And I think after my sophomore year, I always wanted to be a big league baseball player, but I never really, you know, like, I know I can do it. I know I can do it. I'm going to do it. But after my sophomore year and I had that tremendous year, it, it started to hit, hit me. Hey, you can do this. Uh, you're, you know, one draft away as a junior to, you know, being drafted. Scouts were starting to come out and watch me. And this uh, dream of you playing in the big leagues, uh, you know, it's, it's right around the corner as long as you stay healthy. So I come back from my junior year. I had another great year, hit over 380, I think it was. Uh, played great defense at shortstop, noticed the scouts in the stands. And um, this is, uh, this is kind of where the big decision came in because um, that was in 1987. I got to go play in a, a, a tournament called the Intercontinental Cup, and it took place in Cuba. And um, Mark Marquis, who was the baseball coach at Stanford, you guys might know him out there on the West Coast. Um, he just retired a few years ago. He was there for, who knows, 40 years or something like that. Uh, he was going to be the coach of this Intercontinental team, but he was also going to be the coach of the Olympic team. So I got an invite to go to this Intercontinental Cup. And I went down there in Cuba and played lights out. I hit over 400. I led the team in four or five different categories. I really made an impression on Coach Marquis and came back to Indiana University. Like I said, had a great junior year and got an invite to play in the Olympics. Uh, actually, I got a tryout to try out for the Olympics. So obviously that was quite an honor. So after my junior year, I get drafted by the Pittsburgh Pirates, my hometown team, the team I grew up watching, rooting for, 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 you know, 20 years or whatever it was. So I had a huge, huge decision to make. Do I try and go compete for the Olympics or do I sign with the Pirates, start my dream, really my, my baseball, major league baseball career. Uh, it was a huge decision for me. And in the end, I decided you only get one chance to play in the Olympics as a baseball player. You know, other sports like swimming and track and all those, you, you can have some multiple opportunities. But as a baseball player, you got one shot. And that's something I couldn't pass up. I couldn't pass up the opportunity to play for the Olympics. So um, I put my baseball career on hold. Um, I did sign or I, I put my baseball career on hold, turned down the Pirates, went and played in the Olympics and decided to go back to college for my senior year. I uh, had a great Olympics, had a great experience. We toured the entire United States. Um, 
got to go to Japan for three weeks, got to go to Italy for two weeks and play. And then the Olympics were in Seoul, Korea that year. So we went to Seoul, Korea, ended up winning a gold medal. So I have a gold medal to my, uh, my uh, artillery here. Um, so it, w- it turned out to be a great decision. Uh, you know, anytime you can win a gold medal in the Olympics, that's a, that's a pretty good decision. So, um, but I will tell you this, and I think it's important for anybody really to understand what motivates you. What is your motivation to be the best that you can be in whatever you do? And for me, it was three things. And the first thing was mostly it's a lot of times it's money. Obviously, money is a very motivational thing. But for me, it was three things. One was winning. I would do anything to win. I loved winning. I played to win no matter what I did, whether it was baseball, basketball, board games, pickup games, bowling, whatever it may be. I wanted to win and I played to win. And that was a big motivation for me. I was one of those players in the big leagues that um, I would bunt a runner over. I would successfully do a hit and run. I would make the routine plays, things like that. I tried to do the little things uh, to help team win, teams win. So that was my first motivation. My second motivation was fear of failure. I didn't want to fail. And if you, anybody knows anything about Philadelphia, if you fail here in Philadelphia, the fans let you know. And they let you know pretty harshly. And that was a motivation for me because if I struck out at old vet stadium here in Philadelphia, believe me, I did not want to walk back to that dugout and have to listen to that crowd get on me. So the fear of failure really was a motivating factor for me. And I think it is for a lot of people. Nobody wants to fail. Um, So that was a big motivation for me, trying to succeed and doing the best I can and working as hard as I did. I will say this, no one in baseball at the time I played outworked me. I worked as hard as anybody at my craft, especially my hitting. I was, like I said, I was always a good fielder, but I worked at that too. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about a a position change that I had um, a little later, but uh, uh, that was my second motivation. And then came my third motivation. And coach Marquis uh, is a big part of my third motivation. I was motivated when someone told me that I couldn't do something. And when I was playing in the Olympics, we were on tour here in the United States and we played actually close to a town um, in a stadium close to where I grew up. So a reporter came up to Coach Marquis and asked him, what about Morandini? What do you think his, you know, future is going to be in baseball? And Coach Marquis said, you know, he may get to the big leagues, but I don't think he'll ever be an everyday player. And I read that article the next day. And obviously, when you read something like that, it, uh, it hits you. And I was pissed off. I was angry at those words. And I was, let me show you, I'm going to show you. Um, So motivation for me are those three things, winning, fear of failure. And when someone tells me I can't do something, look out, because I'm going to do everything I can to prove you wrong. So uh, I went back to school for my senior year after we won the gold medal, had another great year. And then the Phillies draft me in the fifth round, I believe it was and got to start my pro career as a Philly. So I'll stop it there. Um, and then as we get back into it, I'll take it from there, go and start my pro career. So it was a heck of a ride up until that point. Yeah, that's, that's really amazing. That's awesome to hear. Um, so many awesome experiences. I guess I, I do have like a really quick question for you. Um, would you say that like those three motivating factors obviously are very like athletic driven specifically, like wanting to win badly, whatever kind of competition you're in. Um, would you say that that's carried through the rest of your life? Like as you became like you have different roles now, would you say that you're still motivated by those same or motivated by those same three things? I think I am. Um, you know, I don't win as much now. Um, I, not for lack of effort, but the, the position I'm in now as a team ambassador, there's no winning really. Um, so, but, uh, you know, when I'm playing pickup games or playing against my kids or golfing, I'm a big golfer now, um, that motivation is still there to win. Um, but I think the other two are more important. The fear of failure is still there. You know, I want to be as good as I can be as an ambassador and the things I do. Um, and definitely when someone tells me I can't do something still, I mean, look out, I'm, I'm going to do my best to, uh, try and prove her wrong. So I think those I think those are just a part of me. That's who I am. And those will always be a part of my life. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I see RJ has his hand up. RJ, do you want to go ahead and unmute and ask a question? Yeah. Hi, I'm RJ. Thanks for coming to speak tonight. Um, 
one question. So how surreal was it um, hearing your name like called on draft day after, you know, all those were years of like hard work you put in between, you know, the Olympics growing up, just like throwing the ball at a wall by yourself. Like how surreal was that feeling for you? Yeah, that was uh, well, let's put it this way. It was a lot different back when I got drafted. I got drafted in 1988 and uh, 89. So back in those days, they only announced the first round draft picks. And I wasn't a first round draft pick. So what happened was it, would, it almost took a week for me to get the call after the draft from the scout that drafted me to tell me that I had gotten drafted. So I waited a whole week. I mean, I was nervous as heck. Maybe I didn't get drafted. What's going on? So, you know, if the draft was June 4th, I don't think I heard till like June 11th or June 12th. So it was a very nerve wracking time. But when you get that call, and the scout's on the other end, and he says, hey, I'm such and such with the Pittsburgh Pirates or the Philadelphia Phillies. We just drafted you. We're excited to have – I mean, this, this feeling comes over you like, oh, my God, you know, the dream came true. So it was, it was a very exciting time. You know, for seven days, every time that phone ran, rang, I sprinted to the phone, and uh, for seven days it was somebody other than who I really wanted to talk to. So it was a very nerve-wracking time, but when you finally get that call, it's, it's, over, it's really overwhelming, to be honest with you. Thank you, thank you. That's awesome. Um, I guess kind of along those lines, like at what point did you decide, like, hey, this is what I want to be dedicating my time and energy to? Was that back in high school? Was there someone that motivated you, something – did it kind of just happen? You know, I just, for, mo- for me, most of my motivation is self-motivation. Nobody really had to motivate me to work hard or practice hard or do, th- you know, any of that stuff. It was all self-motivation for the most part. But like I said, I think after my sophomore year, that's when it clicked that, hey, you can do this. You know, you're a year away from possibly getting drafted and starting a big league career. You've had two great um seasons in college baseball and it's a you know it was a big 10 baseball so it was pretty good baseball so it wasn't like I was playing against a bunch of uh you know teams that weren't very good we, we played some good teams so um, I think after my sophomore year is when it really clicked that hey you can do this just keep going keep grinding keep working and let's see what happens yeah absolutely absolutely and like going back to your story really quickly you know you have all of these fantastic opportunities where someone tells you you can't do something, you prove them wrong. Um, Something is presented to you and you take advantage of it. You take full advantage of it with your motivation, with your work ethic. Um, What were some of the harder things that you think you faced? And when something was difficult, how, how did you cope with that and deal with it and like put your mind back on track? Yeah. One of the hardest things is usually as an athlete, if you think about it, you know, little league, whatever sport you play, but for me, little league, legion ball, high school, even college ball, I was always one of the best. So I always succeeded. I didn't really fail in any of those levels. Um, and then minor leagues, I was still one of the best. And I had a couple, and we'll, we'll get into this in a little bit, but I had two great minor league seasons. And then you get to the big leagues and all of a sudden you're not the best anymore. You're just amongst 400 super talented athletes. And like I said, we'll get into this, but after my, First full season, well, during my first full season, I was struggling big time. And it was the first time I had ever failed at a sport. I mean, I was stinking. I was hitting about 220 and um, not playing well at all. And that's when you kind of see, you know, it's, it's easy to play this game when you're succeeding, things are going well, you know, you're having fun. But when things go south and you're playing in Philadelphia and you're getting booed and you strike out again and get booed some more, And the papers are starting to rip on you that maybe you're not the player that we thought you were. And you start reading these things. It can take a huge toll on you. And it did for me. I was only 25 years old, um, still kind of becoming a man, to be honest with you. And here I am playing in front of, you know, 20, 30,000 people that at times are booing me. It's a tough thing to overcome. And um, I'll get into this in a few minutes, but I had a coach that had a talk with me as I was struggling and it had a huge impact on my career. Um, so that's the big thing for athletes nowadays is that first time you fail, how do you respond? Do you get worse and worse and worse, or do you take on that challenge and get through that failure and and start succeeding? So, um, that's the tough part. 
Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. Clearly you took it and did what you could and made the best of it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, kind of moving into your professional career and like moving on with the story. Um, well, you're welcome to, to share as much as you would like, uh, but just as a starting point, what would you say was one of the most like beneficial things that you learned from being a professional baseball player? Like, how did it change you? Yeah. You know, I learned so much from being a professional athlete. If you guys would have known me when I first started as a, as a professional athlete back in, let's say 1990, I was, uh, I wasn't, um, very outgoing. Let's put it that way. I was, wasn't outgoing. I kind of kept to myself, kind of did my own thing. Um, hadn't done many interviews, so I wasn't very good at interviewing. There were so many things that compared to what you see today, um, that I was just completely, you know, I just didn't know a lot. I mean, I just kind of went out, played, played sports and, and that was it. And, and the, the things that I learned first taught, baseball taught me respect, how to respect the fans, how to respect the coaches, how to respect the media, my teammates, um, obviously the hard work part, you know, you got to put the time in every day if you want to be a professional athlete. Um, the big thing I think I learned was how to communicate, how to communicate with my teammates, how to communicate with fans. And most importantly, for a, a professional athlete, how to communicate with the media, um, being a professional athlete, obviously, um, you get, you got to talk to the media almost daily. So that was something that I really progressed and got pretty good at as my, um, career went on. Um, other thing, being responsible on airplanes, being responsible in hotel rooms, being responsible on bus rides, um, learning how to pay bills. I'd never had to pay bills, you know, until I got to, to minor league baseball, never had to pay bills. So I had to learn how to do that, how to rent an apartment, how to pay an electric bill, uh, uh, you know, cable bill, all that stuff. Uh, taxes. I finally learned about taxes. I didn't know a lot about taxes. And this is the funny thing, and you guys probably don't know a lot about this, but as a professional athlete, you pay federal tax, you pay a state tax, you pay a city tax, and every state that you go play in, you pay them taxes. So if I were to come and play in Los Angeles for three days, I'm paying three days worth of taxes. Um, and you're probably going to pay not only the state of California, but you're going to pay to the city of Los Angeles. Now, obviously, you get a refund from not being in Pennsylvania at that time. So you're not paying taxes in Pennsylvania for those days that you play out of out of state. But um, those are just things that I didn't know about. Um, and believe me, when you get that first big league paycheck, you're pretty happy with it. But then you see this list of about you know, half your paycheck that's taken out because of taxes, you're, you're obviously a little bummed and disappointed. But all these things, these all played a role in me being a, a, a professional baseball player. And uh, I grew up real fast. That's for sure. I grew up real fast and learned how to do things real fast. And um, it was like I said, it was it was quite a ride. That's for sure. Yeah, um, I'm kind of interested in the, the story you alluded to earlier about the coach that had a, had a meeting with you. If you want to go ahead and talk about that. Yeah. So I get to, I I have two great minor league seasons. My first year in in minor leagues, I hit 338 in in low a ball, got called up to high a ball, hit 315 for a couple weeks. And in the same year, got called up to double a and hit 360. So I had a great first year in the minor leagues. Second year is the uh, transition year for me because they decided that I was not going to be a big league shortstop that I would have to learn how to play second base, never played second base in my life. So in AAA, I'm learning how to play second base. Um, so I had a really good year in AAA, not a great year, but a good year, hit about 270 in AAA. And I got a great story for my first call up. So um, at the end of the AAA season, it usually ends at the end of August, the big league season goes on into early part of October, but they have September, what they call September call-ups. The roster can expand from 25 players to 40. I think it's changed now. I don't think it can go quite to 40, but back then you could go to 40 players. And you usually knew if you were going to get called up at the, at the end of your AAA season. Well, the rumor was that I was not going to get called up. So I was planning on, we had a couple games left. I was planning on going home, regrouping, you know, taking a little bit of time off just from a mental standpoint and a physical standpoint and then start preparing for the following season. So we're taking batting practice. We're in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which is about two hours from Philly. That's our, where our AAA was at the time. 
And I get a, uh, one of the coaches comes up to me and said, the skipper wants to see you. So I go into the skipper's office. I'm thinking to myself, what, what the heck does he want? We only have a couple games left. I don't know what he wants. So I go in his office. He says, sit down. He goes, the Phillies just traded Tommy Herr. Now, Tommy Herr was the second baseman in the big leagues. He goes, the Phillies just traded Tommy Herr. You're going to the big leagues. Uh, they're playing a doubleheader tonight, and you're starting the second game. So I went from I'm going home to, you know, prepare for the next season to, oh, my God, I'm going to play in a big league game in about two hours. So I gathered all my stuff, to equipment together. I had a car there, drove to Philly, get to the ballpark. The first game was already underway. Get my uniform. They give me number 12, put on my uniform, get ready to go, go down in the tunnel, go into the, the uh, dugout, say hi to the fellas. Game's going on. In seventh inning, I get caught on to pinch hit. I'm facing a pitcher by the name of Eric Shaw. He was a right-handed pitcher for the San Diego Padres. There's probably 5,000 fans in the, in the stands because at that time, the Phillies stunk and fans weren't coming to the ballgame. So I get my first big league at bats. I uh, have a great at bat, work the count full, hit a line drive to left fielder by the name of Freddie Lynn. I'm sure some of you guys have heard that name. I believe he's a Hall of Famer. Um, so the first big league at bat, you know, went pretty well. I just didn't want to strike out my first big league at bat. Well, the game goes extra innings. So I get to come up in the, I think it was the 10th or 11th inning, face a pitcher named Greg Harris, right-handed pitcher again for the Padres. They're guarding the line because they're not giving up doubles. It's a tie game, and I hit a base hit to right field. So I get my first big league hit, my second at bat. So then I can breathe. I can finally breathe. Uh, next batter bunts me over. John Crutt comes up, hits a base hit, and I score the winning run. So I went from playing a triple-A game and going home in a couple of days to getting my first big league hit, scoring my first big league run, which won the game, and now I'm the Philly second baseman. So it was a crazy day, to say the least, all these emotions, excitement, nervousness, you know, astonishment because you're looking and playing in this stadium that holds 50,000 people. Um, it was pretty awesome. So um, – I ended up uh, having an awful September. I hit a, well, I almost had an awful September. I was hitting about a buck 80 and we had two games left <clears throat> and we're playing the New York Mets and I'm facing Doc Gooden and David Cohn. I'd say pr two pretty good pitchers. <clears throat> so I'm hitting a buck 80 and I know, you know, I got to do something here or I'm going to go home hitting under 200 and really, have no confidence that I'm a big leaguer. So I face Gooden and go four for four. I face David Cohn and go two for four. So I went six for eight in the last two games. My average went to 249. So I went from two, 180 to 249. Felt a little bit better about myself. Felt like, all right, maybe you do belong. So I <clears throat> went home that offseason, came back the following year, and uh, did not make the club out of spring training. And I was really angry about it because I was the rookie – and the coach had two veteran players as second basements. And when we came to camp, he said, whoever hits the best is going to make the team. <clears throat> so I hit 270 in spring training. The other two guys hit well under 200. He took those two guys to the big league team and sent me back to AAA. So needless to say, I was very pissed off. Um, there's some motivation right there. Um, fortunately for me, they started off at like 3 and 14 or something. They fired the manager. Brought in Jim Fergosi. I don't know if you guys know who Jim Fergosi is, but he was a big league player for like 20 years and then coached for a long time. So they hired Jim Fergosi. He brings me up the next day, and I'm a big leaguer for the rest of my career. So um, pretty interesting story there. So the story that we were going to get to here, <coughs> in 91, my first full year, I was struggling big time, big time. I was hitting about 220. I was hitting a lot of balls in the air, and, for me, if I hit a ball in the air, it's getting caught. Like I said, I wasn't a big guy. I didn't hit a lot of home runs. I needed to be the type of hitter that hit a lot of line drives, ground balls, use my speed. So one of our coaches named John Vukovic, um, it's in San Francisco at uh, Old Candlestick Park. And he comes in. I come into the ballpark for around 2 o'clock, and he goes, Let, let's go talk. So we go out to the right field corner. We sit down, and he goes, you want to be a big league player? I said, yes, I do. And he said, well, you better stop hitting the damn ball in the air because if you keep hitting the ball in the air, you're going back to AAA. He goes, you need to make a change. So what I ended up doing was I went to this big 
U1 bat. It's this big barrel, big handle bat. It was like, usually I swing a 33, 31 inch bat. This bat was 35 inches, 30, 35 inches, 34 ounces. It was a huge bat. I had to choke up this much just to be able to swing it. But what it taught me to do was kind of swing down on the baseball, hit line drives. And I'm telling you, I did it for about three months in the big leagues. It worked. And things took off for me after that. And I became a really good hitter in the big leagues. But if that coach doesn't take me out to that right field and sit me down and kind of chew me out and get on me, you know, who knows, I might've been sent down and never came back to the big leagues. So that was a, had a huge impact on my career. Um, so 93, we make the world series against the Toronto blue Jays. Um, obviously, you know, here in Philadelphia, when you have a good team, I'm telling you, there's no better place to play. We had 55,000 screaming Philly fans at that stadium here. And, um, we, we came up a little bit short in 93, but I had a great 94, great 95, uh, had a little injury year in 96, and then came back in 97, had another good year, got traded to the Cubs in 98. I don't know if we have any Cubby fans here, but had my had a career year in 98. That was the year McGuire and Sosa had the home run battle. They both hit over 60 home runs. Um, I had career highs in seven different categories there in Chicago. Um, and then uh, – um, came back to Philadelphia in 2000, played a little bit here in Philly. Um, I wasn't a big goal oriented guy because I thought goals in the big leagues put a lot of pressure on you. And I didn't need any more pressure on me than I already put on myself. But one thing I really wanted to accomplish before I got traded to the Cubs, I was about a couple hundred games shy of being the all time games played at second base for the Phillies. So that was a pretty big accomplishment for me. Um, so I ended up getting traded to the Cubs and I'm like, damn, I didn't get a chance to do it, but I got, came back in 2000 and I played about a hundred games. I was probably 120, 130 games shy. I was really looking forward to being the all time games played and I got traded again to Toronto. So never had the opportunity to, uh, um, get that goal that I wanted, but, uh, I think you guys know a guy by the name of Chase Utley, fellow UCLA boy. Uh, he came in in I think 2004 or five, and he would have shattered everybody. He played probably 600 more games than anybody at second base. But uh, uh, so, so yeah, it was a, it was a great ride. A um, couple things I did in the big leagues. I turned an unassisted triple play in 1992. There's only been 15 of them. I was the ninth to do it. I was actually the first second baseman to ever do it in the regular season. So that was quite an honor. I uh, got to play in a World Series, got to play in an All-Star game, um, got to play in the Olympics, as we talked about. So uh, for a, for a you know, 5'10 kid um, out of a small school that weighed about 145 pounds when he was young, um, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the accomplishments I had in the big league. So um, it was a good ride. I had a good ride. I wanted to play a few more years, uh, but ended up having some uh, shoulder uh, issues at a rotator cuff tear. And at that time, I had a couple of young boys. Braden was just born, actually, in 2000. So I had to decide, do I want to have surgery, be out a year and try and come back at 35 years old? Or do I just, you know, hang with my boys, hang with my family, spend time with my family? And I decided just to, to retire and call it a career. But I got almost 11 years in in the big league. So that's something I'm pretty proud of. That's, that's really amazing. That's awesome. Um, really nitpicky, like personal question. I'm curious, how do you, what was it, the unassisted triple play? How did that even happen? Yeah, I'm in Pittsburgh and it was a great place to do it because that's where I'm from. So I had a bunch of family and friends there to begin with, but um, there were guys at first and second, obviously no outs. And this is back when uh, Barry Bonds and Benia and all those great Pirates teams were there. <clears throat> So normally with guys at first and second, you don't send the runners on a full count because you want to stay away from a line drive and a possible double play. But Jim Leland, who was a manager, sent the runners. So runners are going on a full count. Uh, Jeff King hits a line drive up the middle. I dive and catch it. Probably um, four or five steps from second base, sprint to second base, touch second, get ready to throw the ball. And Barry Bonds, who was on first base, was just standing there. He had made no attempt to get back. So I just tagged him for the third out. I mean, the play really lasted probably four seconds, maybe. And at the time, I didn't know how important it was. I was just happy. It was a close game. We got out of the inning. Let's go, you know, score some runs. 
But after the game, all the reporters came up to me and told me the significance of it. So I actually have the base and, uh, you know, my jersey and a couple other items are in the Hall of Fame. So every now and then they rotate some items out there and you can see my stuff at the Hall of Fame. So that's pretty cool, too. Wow, that is that is wild. That's so wild. And it was Barry Bonds, if anybody who happened to be on. And page. it was skinny Barry Bonds. <laughs> yes, we, <laughs> he was going to change quite a bit in the next couple of he years. He changed right after that because the following year he went to San Francisco and 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 things changed. But I will say this about Barry: he is the best ball player athlete that I ever played against, and there's nobody even close. The things he did on the baseball field were utterly amazing. Yeah, so that's that's actually a really good question. Would you say that there were any people, maybe teammates, but Barry Bonds would be a good example that you think inspired you to be a better baseball player, but perhaps also a better better person, better husband in the future, better better father? Well, there was a lot of guys on my team. Darren Dalton, who was our catcher, uh, he passed away about five years ago, brain cancer, died at a much too early age. But he was a great team leader and he was a big part of my success. He really helped me, like I said, deal with fans, deal with the media, taught me a lot about playing every day, playing hurt. Some things you don't see today is a lot of athletes don't play hurt. You know, they NBA players don't even play back to back games anymore, which I think is disgusting. But, um, you know, he taught me all these things. And uh, so he was a big inspiration for me. He was, he not only, wanted to win but he cared about his teammates and and that really rubbed off on me that's awesome um switching the topic just a little bit um as far as some of the people in this club uh, we have some student athletes former student athletes myself included um i know there's a couple football guys on here um do you have any advice for people who are trying to remain in the sports industry even though maybe their career in sports is finishing what, what do you recommend what have you seen yeah i mean you got, I, I think internships are a must. I really do. And there's so many fields that you can get into in sports and, and, you know, and it starts at the minor leagues and works its way up, but you know, there's finance, there's accounting, there's PR, there's youth group, uh, people that in, in, in the Phillies organization that deal with youth groups in the area, um, sponsorships, ticket sales, front office positions, uh, coaching, uh, grounds crew, broadcast. I mean, there's so many different things that you can go into. And I know a lot of play or a lot of employees in Philly now, they all worked as interns and the Phillies liked what they saw and they kept them. And there's, there's, you know, people that were passing out gifts on game day and, and passing out the mail all over. And now they're working in the front office or they're working in the PR department. So, um, don't be afraid to start low. Um, but the big thing is get those resumes to as many teams as you can get those internship requests out and don't be afraid to step out of the box a little bit. Uh, even if, you know, if you want to go into PR, you know, maybe you start out somewhere else as an intern somewhere, and then you work your way up to PR. But uh, my, my advice is to stick with it. If you want something, I personally believe if you want something bad enough, you can achieve it. So, you know, stay with it, stick it out. But internships for me are huge in the sports industry. Really good advice. Awesome. Um, I see Colin has his hand up if you want to go ahead and ask a question, Colin. Sure thing. Thanks, Anthony. And thanks for joining us tonight, Mickey. Really appreciate it. I was kind of curious if you could kind of share with us your thoughts on the current minor league system, like what it was like in your experience, and if you think maybe it should be adjusted in any ways. Yeah, there was a, a question here about – um, I forget what it was, but, uh, oh, it was, uh, what's one thing that you wish you had known back when you were in, in your shoes back when I was playing? Uh, I think the biggest thing is minor league baseball is extremely tough. And the reason it is tough is one, you, you make no money Two, the bus rides are brutal. I mean, you have 10, 12, 14 hour bus rides. So what, and what I mean by that is you'll play a seven o'clock game at night. <clears throat> it's your last home game. Game gets over at 10. By the time you get dressed, showered, eat, get everything packed up, it's probably midnight. Hop on a bus. If it's a 12 hour bus ride, you get into the next city at seven, eight, nine in the morning, and you got to play another game again. Uh, it, it, it's a, it's a rough life. And, and like I said, you don't get paid a lot. Um, 
usually unless you're a high draft pick, you buy your own uh, equipment, you're buying your own bats, you're buying your own gloves, you're buying your own shoes. Um, now that might, that, that's when I played, it may have changed a little bit now. Maybe the clubs, I know the clubs are spending a lot more on food now. It used to be, you know, you hang, you go to McDonald's cause that's about all you can afford to eat when you're on the road. Um, th that has changed. Now the clubs are responsible for feeding the minor leaguers. So the mills and, and, and the big leagues, you, you guys know the game has changed tremendously since I've played with all the different changes, but in the minors, it's starting to change. The minor leaguers have really forced the owners to do some things and food is one of them. So the owners are paying for the food. Now it's much healthier food. They eat at the club, uh, at the ballparks. Now um, I think the ballparks are much better now condition wise. Locker rooms are better. Um, the field play is better. I think the travel is probably a little bit better than it was when I played, but uh, being a minor league baseball player is not the easiest thing in the world to do. And that's actually, that's motivation itself is just to get from A to double A and double A to triple A and, and to get out of these, you know, small cities where the travel's brutal. Like I used to coach in, in, um, uh, in uh, Lakewood, New Jersey, and we actually had to play teams in Georgia, which were 14 hour bus rides. So um, it is no fun. Um, the only thing that makes it fun is if you're succeeding, uh, if you're hitting the ball or you're a pitcher and you're winning a lot of ball games and throwing well, obviously that makes it fun. But if you're a struggling minor league baseball player, uh, it can be a really, really hard road. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing. And I, I see the other hands up. One last quick question about that yeah. would be, are there some other guys that work simultaneous, like other jobs uh, throughout their minor league endeavors and things like that? Like, Did they work other jobs? Yeah, like because you're not making much money. Yeah, you know, I think in the off season a lot of them did. Um, even even not when I played, but back in the '70s when those guys played, they didn't make a lot of money. I know a lot of those guys; they were in the big leagues, and in the off season they would get other jobs. Now, um, I do. I think many minor leaguers, unless, like I said, it's 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 a lot different now. Like I was drafted in the fifth round. And I think my signing bonus was around $35,000. A fifth rounder today probably is in the vicinity of two to $300,000. You know, it, it has gone up that much. Um, so unless you're a lower draft pick, like really low, where you're getting $1,000 or something, I would imagine you almost have to get a summer or a, a, a winter job just to uh, be able to compete the following year and be able to do some things. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to get this right. I believe the hands went up. RJ, Brent, Will. So if you guys want to go ahead, RJ can go ahead. Gotcha. So um, when you're getting ready to play in your World Series game, like what, how like emotionally, like mentally, like, like where were you at, you know, like preparing to like play on like the biggest stage in like your sport and like, you know, at the pinnacle like of your sport as well? I think the hardest part about sports is the buildup. You know, once you get between the lines, whether you're a football, baseball, basketball player, whatever, once you get between the lines, I think, you know, once that first pitch or that first football play or the first shot or whatever, things tend to, to come back to earth. But the build up to playing in a big game like that is very nerve wracking. And playing in a World Series here in Philadelphia, believe me, it was very, very nerve wracking. Um, I can remember. But for me, the thing, <clears throat> nerve, nerve, it was a nervous energy, but that's the way I prepared for the game. I, I got nervous before every game, no matter what it was. Um, but it was a excitement and you know, nervousness. Uh, let's get this thing going, nervousness. And really, when I got out on the field, had that first at bat or got that first ground ball or made that first play, all that went away. And then I just I really toned out the crowd and just concentrated on, on doing my job on the field. But the build up to those big games can be very, very, very nerve wracking. Absolutely. I'm going to read a quote for you guys. And this is kind of <clears throat> the quote I kind of live by. Um, and I, you, you guys might have heard this. It's a Michael Jordan quote. And probably you guys have heard this. But he said <clears throat> about how he, how he became successful. He said, I've missed more than 900 shots. <clears throat> I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed it. 
And he goes, I've failed over and over and over again in life. And he goes, that's why I succeed. So that's what I talk about, being able to fail and learn from that failure so that you can get on and do the things that you're good at. And obviously, Michael Jordan, who's the best to play the game, if you, if you look at those numbers and you say, man, how good could he have been? He missed 900 shots, and lost 300 games, and missed a game-winning shot 26 times. But that's the best player, that ever, one of the best players at least to ever play the game. So uh, I think uh, that's a good testament that just, you know, don't be afraid to fail because it's going to happen. Cool. Uh, Brent, if you want to go ahead and ask a question. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> thank you. So – in something like the minor leagues where sort of everybody's competing against each other to promote or obviously demote sometimes, um, what's sort of like the player to player culture at that time? Is everyone sort of thinking about what each other is doing or are you just sort of focused on yourself? I think the best way to do that would be focus on yourself because once you start worrying about things that are going on around you, that takes away from your focus on the game and that's not a good thing. So um, it doesn't matter what, Joe Schmo's doing over here. It matters what I'm doing. So I would say concentrate on yourself. Be the best. If you're playing, be the best player you can be and let the chips fall where they may. Now, I'm not saying you can't, you know, see what he's doing. You know, if he's playing really well, obviously you got to step up your game. Um, that was the, another thing that motivated me in the big leagues was I always knew there were five, six, seven <clears throat> second basemen that were coming after my job. So I couldn't relax. I still had to uh, play well. I had to do things on the field to help this team win. Because if I didn't, obviously there were people coming after my job. So I kind of took that attitude that you're not taking that job away from me because it's mine. So just concentrate on yourself and do what you do. Thank you. Hey, Mickey. Um, I'm well. I'm awesome. I'm um born and raised in Philly, so go nice. Philly. Um, nice. So I'm going to ask you more of a specific question, kind of geared towards the fan base. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on, like, the Alec Boom kind of debacle at field <laughs> a couple days ago? Yeah. And also kind of a follow-up to that, what's, like, your most embarrassing or humiliate, like, humiliating moment at oh, um, a home game? Yeah. Yeah, um, the bone thing was unfortunate, but um, if you play here in Philly, you got to know um, you can't do that. Um, he got really, really lucky. Now, he, he did the smart thing. He owned up to it after the game. He said, yeah, I said it. And for you guys that don't know what he said, he made three errors in the first three innings, <clears throat> and he was walking to the mound, and the camera caught him saying, I hate these effing people. <clears throat> so... Um, but he owned up to it after the game. He said, yeah, I said it. He goes, I got very emotional because I'd made the errors. I didn't mean it. And the good thing for him is he came out the next day. I think he pinch hit and the crowd applauded him. So I think it's over and done with. But that's something you don't do here in Philly. You do not um, belittle the fans because uh, they will let you know. And, you know, the Philly fans are great because I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. If you go out, play the game the right way, play hard they're going to love you. It's the, really the, the, the actions of not running out of ball, not playing smart baseball, uh, doing some mental things that, that uh, hurt the team. That's when they start the booze and that's when they start getting on you. So if you play the game the right way, now I was fortunate. I played the game hard. I played the game the right way. Always had a great relationship with the fans. I still do today as team ambassador. And, uh, so I was pretty fortunate, but there's a, there's a lot of players that cannot play in Philly because they just can't handle the pressure uh, of playing here. And it happens all the time. Um, one of my, one of my most embarrassing things here at home, um, you know, I didn't really do anything to be honest, to be embarrassed. Um, you know, I made errors like everybody else. I struck out several way too much. I know that like everybody else. Um, I will say this, when I went to Chicago, um, I was one of those players that always caught pop-ups and fly balls with two hands, always. It was just the way I was taught and it's the way I did things. Well, I'm playing in Chicago and we're in a pennant race in 98 um, and we're playing the Pirates and it's a 3-2 game 
a runner on first, two outs, and a guy hits a pop-up to shallow right field, and I go back, and I one-hand it and boot it. And we're in, it's late September. We need every win we can get. Fortunate enough for me, um, we got the next guy out, and we didn't lose the ball game. But that was probably one of my most embarrassing moments was making an error like that in a big game. Um, but uh, I don't know if I really ever did anything that was embarrassing, to be honest with you. At least I, I can't remember. <laughs> Yeah, that's probably for the better, even if something happened. Yeah, maybe I maybe I did a lot of embarrassing things. And it's just I just wiped it out of my mind. I don't know. Exactly. Um, okay, well, I see it's 7 o'clock, so I want to respect everyone's time. So I'm going to ask you one final question. I mean, it's, it's really just do you have any advice for people uh, moving forward, whether we want to be playing sports, whether we don't, whether we want to work in the sports industry, or even if we don't, what do you think is, like, one of the biggest things that we should be trying to do? You know, I, I, the biggest thing is is go after it. Go get it. Uh, nothing's going to be handed to you. Nothing's going to be given to you. Um, I think, like I said, the internships are big. Getting resumes out to as many people as you can is big. Stepping out of the box a little bit is big. Don't be afraid to travel. Um, um, a lot of you probably Californians, don't be afraid to get the hell out of California and, and go work. That, that's Okay. Um, it's too expensive there in LA anyway, right? You don't want to stay there, but, uh, but, uh, if you have a dream and there's, there's a certain aspect you want to do in sports and I, we haven't even mentioned this analytics is so big now. I don't know how many guys are, are into analytics, but I know here in Philadelphia, <clears throat> we hire probably 20 new employees every year. And I'm telling you 15 of them are analytics people. So it's big and it's big everywhere, not even in sports. Everybody's using it now, but it is unbelievably big in sports. So if that's something you guys are interested in, uh, there are a lot of places you can go and, and, and help with the analytics part of sports. That's for sure. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic meeting. Um, I think there was a lot of valuable stuff to be gained from that. Uh, you're welcome to jump off if you want. I'm really quickly going to go over what we're going to be doing in the next couple of weeks. All right, guys. Um, Good luck to all of you. Um, I will say this. I was a little disappointed in the basketball team this year. I think they should have went a little farther. Oh, no. I did see that they're going to be – they're ranked number one in the preseason poll, so I guess you guys got some <clears throat> young talent there that are coming back. So how's the baseball team doing there? They're always pretty good, right? They're always pretty good, yeah. We're doing pretty well. All right. Well, I wish all you guys the best of luck, and, uh, you know, maybe we'll get a chance to do this again sometime. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you again. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, and if you guys don't mind holding on for one second, real quick, let me share my screen. Okay. Um, so quick reminder of the attendance policy. If you did not see it in the chat, I believe Owen sent it earlier. Um, just go ahead and sign it. You'll get two points for it. And these are the rest of it. Uh, we just kind of keep track of it to make sure that if there is a limited opportunity for some sort of field trip or something, we can be sure to give it to the people who have been coming to the meetings, participating, et cetera. Um, what are we doing next? So we have a meeting on the 20th at 6 p.m. and it is going to be a resume interview workshop. So one thing that I would suggest is I know myself would gladly look over someone's resume, someone's cover letter, uh, help them interview. So by all means, if you have a cover letter or a resume that you want to be looked at, I know there are a bunch of upperclassmen as well that would love to help you out. We have some pretty good experience with that. Um, not only will we be explaining how you should do it, but we can help you edit something that you already have. So that's always really helpful. I know it helped me uh, when I was a little bit younger and Bisba had a, a cover letter workshop as well. So just be ready for that. That's going to be on the 20th at 6. And then we are also going to be going to the baseball game this Friday at 7. We're going to meet at the Denev turnaround at 6. Uh, there's buses leaving from there. It should be a blast. Uh, I already know a bunch of guys already going. So if you guys want to come, by all means, just swing by the Genev turnaround at 6, and we'll hop on a bus, go watch the game, get some hot dogs, drinks, chips. It should be a really good time. Um, yeah, so that's all we've got. Thank you guys so, so much. Um, hopefully we'll catch you guys next week. And if anybody has any questions or anything, you're welcome to stick around. I'll be here. And have a great week, you guys. Bye.